<laughs> so without further ado, I'll introduce Ollie Prescott, who is from uh, the Biological Records Centre at UKCEH, and he's been there since 2013 as a plant ecologist and data analyst. And his research interests include understanding biases in large data sets, probably quite useful for this project, invasive species and ecological monitoring. And he's going to give us the outline science results. Thanks very much. Well, there have been some fascinating talks and it's going to be a hard act following some of those, definitely. Um, I'm just going to talk broadly about how we went about estimating distribution changes the floor is a Britain and Ireland uh, for this project, uh, and also how we went about presenting them uh, both in the book and the website. So I did include this slide going over the history of uh, Atlasing uh, as it's involved BSBI and BRC over the decades, but obviously Chris already did a far better job than I would be able to do on that and gave us all the key points of lots of fascinating historical Insights. So I'm probably just going to skip over this and point you to that publication mentioned at the bottom of the screen there. If anyone wants to read more about that or find out some of the references that um, support that that timeline that we've been on through this long collaboration between the Biological Record Centre and the BSBI. Um, thinking about that that progress and thinking about the wonderful machines and technological advances that we saw in, in Chris's talk. I, I thought that perhaps it's a we need a photo of me and Pete and, and Kevin and Rich sitting at our laptops huddled over, <laughs> hunched in our lonely offices during the COVID, the COVID months, because probably rather less spectacular than standing over one of those giant machines that we used back in the in the 60s, but it's probably more representative of the process that we went through uh, during the production of this atlas. So maybe we should capture some of those at some point. Uh, I just included this slide as the background for what we're talking about, but this was taken just directly from Kevin's overview talk, which he gave on, on the 8th a couple of weeks ago, and obviously we saw the recording of it as well, and it just kind of shows the process and reminds us what we're looking at in terms of est estimating those distribution changes using those, those Atlas projects at 10 kilometres, and obviously we've got that well-worn example of be orchid there if the long term the moderate increase but this is the type of process that we're thinking about when we're taking the summary data at 10 kilometers uh, and coming up with some sort of measure of change in distribution or, or range size or however you, you want to refer to it. Um, I'd like to say that with Florence Nightingale the whole process of this was uh, reviving and refreshing when I saw tables of statistics and uh, pages of computer output and reams of code that were written for this project, um, but reviving is not a word that I would use. Uh, a couple of moments of sheer panic, a number of cold sweats, and not a few, not a few decisions to be made, uh, and often quite thorny decisions. Uh, obviously these link into some of the things that Pete was talking about in his talk, but these are some of the considerations that we have to make specifically uh, for the estimates of change that uh, we're talking about now. Uh, obviously, fundamentally, we're talking about changes in national distribution or range size, but of course, we have to <coughs> decide on a spatial scale at which to work, a uh, spatial resolution or grain size, and everything we've done in this project has been at 10 kilometers. And that's uh, a decision which is not made lightly, but which is designed to average over the biases which are more severe at the finer scales at one kilometre and two kilometre and often introduce far greater things, uh, far greater challenges in interpreting the data. For instance, as you go further back in time, records at finer scales are far more likely to be of rare and scarce or critical taxa uh, and the spatial biases severely increase as well. For instance, as Chris mentioned in his talk, in certain areas of Britain, particularly Wales and Scotland, the new atlas data tended to be more likely to be submitted uh, on MasterCards, which means that finer resolution data don't exist. So that decision, as I say, is not taken lightly, but feeds into the, the, the desire to say something uh, with minimal error as far as we can. Uh, the same applies to taxonomic aggregation. If we just bung in every single taxon name in the BSBI DDB, a lot of the changes that we see will be to do with changing taxonomic understanding, uh, the levels at which people record. So we had to make separate decisions there um, for the two different analyses that we've spoken about as well. 
all those long-term and short-term trends on the website and in the book, they're not just the product of running the same analysis twice at two different timescales. There are different lists of taxa that are fed into each of those timescales. So for the long-term trends, the change is only modelled the taxa that were mapped in the first atlas and which were and combined with taxa which were listed in Clapham, Tutin and Warburg, the, the field flora, the flora that was most in use for that period of recording for the first atlas. Um, so we're restricting those change estimates there. Um, equally for the, for the short term trends, you know, we didn't uh, want to create trends for every single subspecific taxon or, or variety and uh, named cultivar. Um, we made a limit. Uh, we made a decision to limit the the eligibility of ne neophytes of the, the new aliens into the change analysis as well, limiting it somewhat arbitrarily uh, to those which had at least thirty hectares. So there, there's another decision that needed to be made there. Um, perhaps more technically, and this is in relates to the actual model that we're using to try and understand change. Um, any given statistical model will make assumptions about the data that are going into that model. So then we need to make sure, as far as we can, that those assumptions are actually met uh, for those data sets. And that links into all of the previous uh, uh, criteria that are listed there, but also includes some other things that I'll go on to talk about in a moment. And finally, um, and also as Pete said, uh, you know, because we wanted there to be a step change to innovate uh, with this project, we also wanted to think about how to better capture and represent uncertainty. Um, quantitative ecologists, particularly modern ones, have a propensity to run some data through a pipeline and then believe everything that comes out of it. And that's not the way that I like to do things, and it's not the way that I'm sure the BSBI would like their data interpreted either. So we wanted to make sure that we were being honest in respect of what we could actually say from the data uh, and the analysis that we decided to undertake. Uh, and not merely present a whole load of numbers uh, and expect people to swallow them all whole in all situations and circumstances. Um, so that's an important part of what comes in this talk and, and obviously in what's presented on the website and the book that we've already uh, seen in several other talks. So one of the key things obviously about these analyses, and this is obvious to everyone in this room, I'm sure, is, is the changing effort and how we account for that. And obviously it's not effort in terms of boots on the ground, although that is part of it. There was a huge amount of effort which went on in the first atlas in the 1950s, which is not represented in the database simply because data were aggregated at the hectare level. So when we say effort here, we also include things such as digitization efforts, uh, you know, what information that were collected in the 1950s and beyond uh, actually end up in the database and are actually accessible to us now. How much information is there there? And so the figure 5.2 there on the left, that's taken from the Atlas introductory chapter. And the native, the kind of dark green colour there, I think it displays this perhaps most clearly. Obviously, the, the turnover, in the number of native species we have in Britain and Ireland over that period is minimal. Um, and of course, on the whole, many species and native species have declined. But of course, there, in terms of species hectare combinations for natives, there's a huge increase in the number of uh, hectare um, taxon combinations that are now in the database. Um, and that's the type of, that, that really illustrates the challenge of, of, of dealing with that and interpreting change and coming up with these change estimates. On the right, you can see a similar type of thing and that one just for England, for this England launch I put in. And that shows again, you probably can't read the, the X axis there, uh, but the third period from the left is kind of the broad recording period from the first atlas. You can see there the, the paucity of one kilometre or finer data, uh, the large chunk of 10 kilometre, and that scale on the y-axis there is in millions, so that is quite a lot of data from the 10 kilometre there for that period. But lots of historic tetrad data that came from the burgeoning uh, tetrad recording effort at that time, and also you know, data that have been digitised since from historic projects, either rescued from printed atlases, rescued from recording cards, or indeed like just diaries and things like that. You know, we're always accumulating historic data and therefore improving our ability to say things about earlier time periods as well. Um, but you can see there that say, if you tried to do analysis at one kilometer going back to 1960, um, that is far from a random sample of one kilometer squares in 1960. So you'd basically end up saying nothing of value whatsoever if you tried to do that. Um, 
So I won't spend too long on this. I think probably the main thing to say about the method that we've used is that it was invented by a botanist, a field botanist, a mathematician, Mark Hill, who everyone here in Cambridge will be familiar with. And you know, I, I still think that this method that he's used is actually ahead of its time, even now, and that there are still people publishing on these topics in the literature who are rediscovering things that Mark pointed out uh, you know, decades ago. And one of the key mathematical insights underlying this message actually derives from one of Mark's very early papers um, published back in 1976, I believe. Um, so the, the key idea is to uh, take into account effort as it varies across time and space um, and to introduce uh, various means of adjusting for that. So it starts with defining a neighbourhood in the top left for every grid cell that you're looking at. Uh, that example there is actually for a tetrad in, in Oxfordshire for a separate project. Um, obviously, in this case, we did it for the 10 kilometre to grid cells. And the idea there is that we want to come up with a, a local species frequency curve. So we're looking at the relative frequency of species within a, a delimited area and then repeating that across the whole of Britain. So for each of those neighbourhoods, there is one of these species frequency curves, and that's taken from Mark's paper, that, that figure there in item two. And obviously those local frequency curves um, vary because of varying species richness across Britain and also uh, in terms of the effort that's gone into recording uh, those neighbourhoods, those hectare neighbourhoods. Um, and Mark invented an ingenious way of rescaling those so that they all have the same shape. So we're adjusting for different species richness um, and, and then turning it into a rank based thing so that once they're all standardised, we can kind of deal with them in a, current, a common currency. And once we have that common currency for any neighbourhood, we can look at a, a top percent of species, which Mark called benchmark species. And those are then used to index changing effort. Um, because we've standardised all of these neighbourhoods across Britain, we can use that information about locally common species, which obviously vary across Britain, to have a kind of common approach to, uh, to estimating change. And it's those benchmark species that allow you to create these time period or time factor relative frequency estimates, um, because basically the key logic is that uh, if fewer benchmark species were recorded, then the effort was lower and, and we can then uh, come up with a metric that adjusts for that and the size of that metric relates to um, its relative frequency in that period. Um, so obviously that has a number of assumptions underlying it, which I, I mentioned earlier, and one of them is that species are recorded in proportion to their, their true frequency. So even if there are fewer records in an area, the common species are still commoner than the rare species in that, in that, in that database. Uh, and that's an assumption that's not always met, and that's where some of the uncertainty communication that I'll talk about in the following slides uh, comes from. And so the final bit there, item five, that's for Fanangia Petraea, the, the white points and the, uh, and the standard deviations, those are the outputs from Frescalo. And I kind of built on that with a couple of fairly straightforward uh, resampling based approaches where we've just fitted various types of models um, repeatedly to get estimates of um, uncertainty and to smooth between the different time periods for presentational purposes. Um, so I just, uh, Rich has already covered this actually, so I won't, I won't half on this for too long, but this is just a static uh, picture of the one of the trend pages on the website uh, for the Onstan Hispidus. Um, and just going through the plots from top left. So on the top left, we have those, this is for the short term trend, I should say, for England. So I've tried to use England specific examples in this talk, it's the England launch. Uh, so there for that species, there's a the first one is a smooth time trend. So what we've done there is fit a, a smoother to those um, fresh, basically random numbers that we've resampled from the, those Frescalo means and standard deviations in each time point. And then every time we've sampled a random number from those distributions, we fit a something called a generalized additive model. And we've done that a hundred times. And then we've taken the uncertainty bounds, 90% uncertainty interval and plotted it there. So that's that first top left one. Now, perhaps the more of an innovation is the top right one, which is not my innovation, I should say. This is something that was developed in the in computer science in the, and it's um, something which uh, visual computer scientists who work in the visualization industry have um, kind of pioneered. And it's something just simply called a line ensemble and it works on the same basis, but we've just bootstrapped, um, taken those random numbers from those distributions and then fit linear trends. Um, 
And one of the arguments for doing this is it makes it easier for people to understand the uncertainty. Often ecologists and other scientists present things like standard deviations, standard errors or standard confidence intervals. Uh, and often if you show those plots to people and ask them to interpret them, even professionals can't actually explain to you what those uh, metrics mean. Um, and so if specialists have a, have a problem interpreting those error bars, then there's probably not much hope for the rest of us. So one of the ideas behind this technique is it actually makes it more intuitive what type, what the uncertainty actually means. And one of the things is you, know, you can values outside of the, the range of the estimated standard deviation are possible, et cetera. And the error, you know, a point doesn't have to be within an error, sorry, a, 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 a uncertainty interval. And that even with those, um, those errors, you can get trends which are not parallel um, to the, the line that the eye would draw through those points and things like that. So, and that led into the visualization that we actually use in the book, because once you've got those slope estimates, uh, you can plot the distribution of those uh, slopes. And that's what the bottom left one is there um, with the blue line is the, the estimate for the species. And the, the gray line, which Rich mentioned in his talk is actually the distribution across all species within that trend category. So that's the distribution across all species in England uh, post 1987, so you can kind of see that we can't see here actually because um, the uncertainty is very large for some of the nested countries. It's better if you look at Britain or Ireland, uh, but you can get the impression that overall there was a, a general estimated decline across all species and see where this species fits within that. And once you've got that distribution, you can then basically divide up that continuous um, uh, density that distribution. And that's the way, that's what we've done here to get that classification of estimates. And that underlies that bar chart on the right there, underlies those colored lines, that colored graphic in blue that Rich showed on the website and which appears against every species caption in the, in the book as well. And of course that discretization is essentially arbitrary. You could put those cut points anywhere. You could have as many categories as you want. So it was a trade-off between having a, a small number of interpretable capital, ca categories that look good on the page and look good when we summarize them um, and making sure that it, it kind of made sense in an ecological sense. Um, so we tried a, a couple of different ones and ended up with those specific cut points, but they are, I should, you know, they're not uh, God-given. There's not some, some, some sort of fundamental truth there. It's just how we thought it was best in terms of the different species that we looked at to communicate the uncertainty in those trends. Uh, and so we hope by that to move beyond the single value metric, which was presented in the new Atlas, which of course, that Telfer method, which is a, a big innovation for its time and a very useful technique, um, but we wanted to communicate more of the, the uncertainty under this project, as I've mentioned. So this is just a table that's taken straight from chapter six in the introductory section of the Atlas, just so showing the number of these estimates uh, categorized by species status just for Britain and Ireland uh, and, and giving a quick overview of how many there are. <coughs> so, you know, just over 6,000 um, in the book. And we've also got these comparisons of slopes which are featured in the introductory chapters of the Atlas as well, where we look at change between the long-term and the short-term trends. And we didn't quite have time to do any visualizations for those. As, uh, so unfortunately we haven't really been able to make as much of those as we would have liked, but hopefully they'll feature in, in other ways in the future on other, in other projects. Um, we've got another almost well, over 15,000 uh, trends on the website only, which are the ones for England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, etc. So that's uh, 22,000 <coughs> trends that we actually generated for this project. And obviously, which I'll go on to talk about, we didn't check every single one um, <laughs> to see if it made sense. Uh, and that's something I'm going to talk about a bit more now. So I'll skip over this one because I've already discussed that on the other page, but that just shows you on the right hand side how that bar chart links to the little summary strip that's on the website, but I'm sure you've all intuited that by now anyway. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is just an example across species again, which I'll probably skip through just to show you a few different examples of that uncertainty and how it looks once you've classified it. So one of the other things we did for those line ensembles was to make them translucent. So when there's high agreement in the model based outputs, obviously they look, they kind of approach a, um, a single line visually. Uh, and when they're all over the place, that presentation thins out as well. So if I have a there on the bottom left, you can see much more uncertainty, but still 
and I think this comes across more clearly in the in the discretized version. You can still there's still a strong belief that there's a, a strong decline that tallest bar on the left there. And for Pylasia, there's that very strong. I mean, that's an example that's often used. Um, big decline, obviously, uh, was first noticed in the first atlas as well. And the, yeah, lots of lowland fens and lots of management of lowland fens, etc. So it's very confident, uh, strong decline, uh, moderate decline for that species. So. So this gives you a bit of a, an idea of variation and how that looks up. But as I said, that these trends are not all correct. There are assumptions of any model and those assumptions are important. And if those assumptions are violated, then it undermines the output from the model to some extent. And we need to think about communicating that. And we didn't actually do this in the end because we simply didn't have time. And it would have been a huge undertaking to go through every species uh, trend, even for Britain and Ireland, and to come up with some sort of graphic which allowed us to communicate our trust in that metric. And so here's just one example for Potomacetum polygonotholius, where for the historic data um, from the first atlas, that is actually the 1930 to 1969 date class, um, it's probably, well, it's considered that it was probably under-recorded because people, um, the distinguishing characters between that species and natans were not well known and people were less confident in a signing records of polygonotholia. So that increase is probably entirely spurious um, because it's entirely driven by the fact that that species was under-recorded relative to its true hectare frequency in relation to other species in that first date class. And in a paper that we published when we were developing methods for the atlas, we said, well, people should probably take this into account and come up with some sort of qualitative risk of bias when they're presenting these metrics. And that's the type of thing which I nicked from the medical literature, so all the best ideas in this are just stolen from other disciplines, <laughs> but that also shows the benefit of reading outside of ecology, um, uh, and if you want to pick up on these things. So that's not something we've done, but it's something that would be nice to get funds for so that we communicate our trust in those metrics going forward so that people don't just download lists of numbers and then believe them naively. And so I suppose there is one way in which we've done that, perhaps accidentally through this project, not accidentally, but not by design, um, because of the process that Pete described earlier. Um, there were timescales on which we had to work for different aspects of the project, and the captions were quite a, a relatively early um, part relative to the analysis at least. So the captions and uh, the trend editors, the, sorry, the caption editors didn't see any of the model-based outputs when they wrote their trends. So the trend ca uh, caption on the website for any species doesn't take into account the effort adjusted results. So in some cases, well, in many cases, or, well, I say many, in a number of cases, I don't know honestly <laughs> how many, because I haven't looked through and calculated that, but it'd be interesting to do that as an exercise in itself. In a number of cases, there are discrepancies between these effort adjusted trends uh, and what the caption says. And obviously that's highly variable in terms of what the, how how deep the caption editors have gone into the reasons, uh, into recording biases or taxonomic change and all those types of things. But here are just a, a few examples. So for Sweet Sicily there, there's um, yeah, reasonably confident decline for Britain and Ireland, but the comment in the trend caption says evidence for increased frequency locally, which of course might, be, might still be true, although there is still a decline in England if you look at the England trend on the trend page for this species. That's not to say that this isn't true in some vice counties, but in terms of presenting that overall country level trend and the local detail, there's obviously a, a slight mismatch there. Um, so Cimbrium officinale, again, says it's uh, no significant change in the distribution since the 1960s in much of our area. But again, there's quite a clear decline on the fringes in the north and west, probably linked to perhaps the decline in um, more extensive arable in those areas. Um, over the, well, over the last 50 years. Um, and that's not picked up by the caption at all. Uh, oh, sorry, I put the actual classification there. Yes, so there's a strong decline. Um, and then for deer grass, there obviously these uh, taxonomic issues. So there, the short-term trend shows a very strong increase. Um, and there, we, this was probably my fault, we should have used the aggregate category for the short-term trend as well as the long-term trend. But when we went through those customized lists for each period, uh, we tended to err on the side of not aggregating things because we just uh, naively assumed for some things such as this that there, there would be enough data for those segregates to make that reasonable approach. But in a number of cases, that turned out to be not the case. And because of the 
the temporal sequence of how all these things took place, often there wasn't time to then go back and change that decision because uh, all the editing that went into the actual data and all the error checking and things meant that the actual final iteration of the database export that came to me for analysis were you know, relatively late in the day relative to things like this. So we kind of stuck to our guns and went with what our kind of a priori decision making around these things. So it's not to have too much back and forth. Um, the last part of this talk just uh, quickly overviews how we went about creating all the smooth trends, which are not on the website, obviously, but are in the, well, they are on the website and that you can download them in the PDFs that are on the website, uh, but mainly they're for the publications, the summary report and the, the, uh, the introductory chapter. And uh, what we did there is for those smooth trends, so this isn't for the linear, those line ensembles, which underline the change graphics, but it's for those smooth trends. Uh, we basically, for any given category, so the example there is for the status categories, for natives, archaeophytes and neophytes, um, in those cases, um, for all the native species, we basically, again, resample the data for every given species. So for, we repeat this a number of times, so in simulation one there on the left, we take some random values for each species, um, fit a smoother just to those individual data points, and then in each, for each simulation, we uh, basically average over those those species trends. So we end up with a hundred different um, aggregation aggregated trends. And if you've got those 100 different aggregated trends, then you can use that to get the uncertainty as well. So the uncertainty in these uh, multi-species indicators or aggregated trends is basically that, again, that bootstrapping process of fitting a um, hundred different smoothed trends, creating a hundred different multi-species indicators and then using that uncertainty to be able to present those uh, error bars on those trends. And, and also the other nice thing is it allows you to smooth between those date class mediums. Um, so it's a slight illusion in a way in that the information underlying those plots is for those date classes, not for each year, but we can predict from those models to get estimates for any year so that we can smooth between those uh, date classes. And so we come on to the, the final section, which is just overviewing uh, all of those aggregated trends for England. So all of these plots uh, are not actually presented anywhere. These are not in the summary report and not in the, the atlas, uh, again, because we didn't have space for them. Um, hopefully all these country level aggregated trends <laughs> will be used by the State of Nature um, Partnership, which will, I think will write uh, a new report for the State of Nature later this year. So hopefully all of these trends will be used uh, in that for all the different country reports. Um, so these are those outputs for England. Uh, essentially, they're very similar to the, the GB ones, except the, the decline of natives is even steeper uh, in these England trends, particularly for the long term. And the, the metric that obviously made the rounds in the last couple of weeks, about 53% of natives on average having declined in Britain, that's even higher for these England stats. You can see there, and that graphic is in the summary report, that it's 65% of natives for England um, uh, and uh, actually a similar figure for archaeophytes, that's not too different for Britain um, and a similar figure for the neophytes, but the, there is a big jump there from 53% to 65% for England, obviously it's the more intensively managed and farmed lowland landscape of England has taken more of a pummeling over the, over the years. Um, so again, the England trends, uh, most of these are very similar to the, uh, the GB trends again. So on the left there, for soil reaction or substrate pH, again, the steepest declines are for the, uh, the, acidic, the acidic plants and the uh, plants of acidic soils and plants of basic soils, uh, not too big a surprise, much greater uncertainty for the, uh, for the species of acidic acidic habitats. And that's not because there are fewer species going into that trend there, that's about 600 species that are averaged over. It's just that it is because of the greater variation uh, in what's happened to those species across different habitats uh, and things. So it's the, just different, more different types of species going into that, making that broad trend much more uncertain. And that trend, you know, that error bar on that trend could even sustain perhaps a stability or even a slight increase where there are probably species with um, on the edge of being uh, true calcifuges, but perhaps in uh, more widespread habitats in the open countryside, perhaps on road verges and things like that, that have actually benefited from certain types of disturbance or, or uh, leaching of soils and things like that. Um, again, on the right-hand side, fertility is very much the same as the, uh, the GB trend. 
except I think in some of the cases, the GB trends do level off somewhat, whereas in these England trends, they, they carry on. I think for the nitrogen one, yes, there is a, I think there's a hint in the GB level ones that those um, for the, the moderate and the high fertility levels, they start to level off in the recent date classes for Britain. But for England here, they, they kind of carry on the same trajectory. Um, uh, for the, for the light, light environment, the, the shade and semi-shade and the, uh, the well-lit habitat, our steepest decline is obviously again for the open habitat, and that's obviously because a lot of those species are actually for those infertile open habitats, acid grasslands and chalk grasslands. Um, and uh, for the shade, it's obviously the, the woodland species in general, which we'll come on to, haven't seen that much change at the 10 kilometer scale. But of course, in many cases, there will be much smaller scale changes as well. Um, for moisture, this is uh, a common pattern throughout the, the aquatic species in the atlas. A lot of those strong declines, uh, even for the later date classes, are probably largely driven by recording bias um, because the last two recording periods didn't have quite the same effort that was expended in the late 20th century on recording. Uh, various aquatic species. So, although of course there no doubt, well, in many cases there will be a, a true decline. In other cases, they're probably um, largely driven by by bias. So those trends are much harder to interpret. There's a, a correlation between uh, having a trend in that category and uh, the selection bias of the actual what's going on in the field. Um, for the habitat associations, again, these are quite similar to the. Um, GB trends that have done the rounds and in the summary report. Uh, the species of coniferous woodland obviously much shallower increase as we're excluding Wales and Scotland from, uh, from those trends. Um, I think the broadleaf woodland has a bit more of an uptick, which again is probably due to species such as Kerex pendulum, things like that, and various uh, species that have that admixture of garden escapes and perhaps uh, more robust genotypes and horticulture that have spread very successfully. Um, I think the arable decline is steeper here for England as well, relative to Britain. Um, a similar thing with the, the grassland habitats there as well, the calcareous and the, the acid grasslands are slightly steeper, I think, than, uh, than they are in Britain. And the, the trend for neutral grassland in Britain does level off in the last two date classes, which is something that came out of the, the Local Change Project uh, publication in 2006 as well. But here you can see for England, it does actually continue declining. It doesn't, doesn't level off. Um, so finally, we've got the, the more upland habitats. Obviously, the species that are actually in the montane habitats category here are not very common in England, and there aren't many species or, or hectad species combinations, and those are largely stable and don't show the slight decline that I think is evident in the British trends, which do include Scotland, obviously. Um, otherwise, um, similar declines to GB for the dwarf shrub heath and uh, bog. Um, the, again, and this is just a different view on the aquatics, it's perhaps worth also saying for the, the aquatic habitats there that those declines do include some non-native species which have actually declined as well, just something that's perhaps not been highlighted in the recent media interest. Things like Azola was the top of the, uh, the, the change, so in those shifting change metrics that we did, which looks the change in slope between the long the, the, the long-term trend and the short-term trend, Azola actually showed the largest um, decline in uh, the steepest difference between those trends. In other words, the declining trend got much steeper in the most recent date class. Elidea canadensis, Lagrosiphon, they also showed strong declining trends. And things like outside of the aquatics point that's sticking with the non natives, Bellopia japonica, Renutra japonica, Renutra saccharinensis. Raclan, Mantagazian, and they also showed uh, declines in the recent date classes as well. So clearly some invasive non-natives are starting to drop off, whether that's um, insects and fungal disease, specific control programs or efforts. Um, I can personally say specifically, it's probably a combination of all those factors. Um, so that's something very interesting that's come out of the, um, the atlas as well. So I just wanted to, sorry, I'm probably overrunning. I just wanted to end with this point here about which is, one of the most sophisticated insights that I've read into the process of natural history as it relates to collaborations between people like myself working within official institutions with research council funding and uh, the amateurs and volunteers who are hard at work collecting the data under the auspices of the BSBI. And you know, David Allen pointed out that each group needs the other. And that tradition is a, one of un an unconscious tradition of compromise between conflicting interests. And, but even so, that each group needs the other, and societies 
of a gain is ultimately by holding those mixtures in a state of perpetual mild <laughs> tension. And I think we've, we've seen that today, I think, in all of the, uh, the decisions that have to be made in terms of visualization and creating products and publishing atlases and editorial lines and all that type of thing. Um, and we'll no doubt see it in the future for new projects as well. So I wasn't sure whether they were hypertensive or hypertensive. So I called them paratensive and that <laughs> they might just keep my blood pressure on an even kill for the future. Uh, and so there are some questions that come out of this work. You know, how can we reconcile expert-based and model-based change estimates? How can we communicate those that reconciliation or those differences even more clearly? Uh, can we do more nationally with smaller scale data about increasing biases and confusion? And can we capture more data at the habitat and community level so that we can understand processes that actually drive these large scale trends, which we are now pretty expert at interpreting and analyzing. And that's it, thank you. And um, it's amazing to see the effort that's gone into removing some of the biases. Um, mm. It must have been a bit of a labour of love. Um, but yeah, <laughs> worth it. Um, are there any questions online? There is one from <coughs> Wendy Moore who wants to know extrapolating from the overall trend charts, if when the upward neophyte trend crosses the downward native trend, what strategies might be envisaged? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, those, those trends are in, um, well, they do index uh, distributional change at the 10 kilometer scale. So just because something has gained a species hectad combination, in other words, uh, something has been recorded as established or outside of a garden and it's a non-native, doesn't necessarily follow that there's a direct impact on a native plant species or habitat. So I think that's why we need more data on the, the habitat level um, community processes, because we can make very broad brush statements and come up with broad policies, which are no, about, no doubt sensible. Um, for instance, there were numerous campaigns over the last few years about, you know, not dumping water from aquaria, you know, check, check clean dry in terms of cleaning your uh, boating equipment and canoes when you're moving between water bodies and not dumping garden waste and all those types of things. And obviously they help to protect natural habitats, but um, I think the actual interpretation of those crossing lines is rather more nuanced and doesn't directly lead to action in that in the same way. 